The Art of Waging Small Business Warfare Podcast, teaching Davids how to defeat Goliath. Now here's your host, Mark Anthony Peterson. Welcome back to the podcast for entrepreneurs, startups, and business mavericks. In this podcast, we teach entrepreneurs how to defeat the corporate giant. Just like in the story of David and Goliath, David defeated a much taller and stronger Goliath, not by fighting the giant in hand-to-hand combat but by using technology. A slingshot. The slingshot allowed the smaller David to attack from a distance that minimized the advantages that Goliath had over the smaller David. My name is Mark Anthony Peterson. I am a serial entrepreneur and managing executive at Serial Consulting, a leading small business strategy and technology consulting firm. I'm also the author of the book Gorilla Panur, Small Business Strategy for David's Wanting to Defeat Goliath which is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and iTunes. This podcast is brought to you by Sierra Consulting. An idea can launch a business. A strategy can take it global. During our last podcast, Episode 6, we introduced you to the Growth Capacity Framework, which helps business owners and startups create enough management capacity that they can focus on areas of explosive growth. The framework examines business tasks along two dimensions. Do the tasks differentiate your business? And are the tasks critical to the daily delivery of your product or service? Using this framework, I advised you to sort your business tasks into one of four quadrants. Core competencies. These are tasks that differentiate your business and that are critical to the daily delivery of your product or service. New competencies. So these are tasks that differentiate your business, but they're not critical to the daily delivery of your product or service. Outsource. They neither differentiate you, nor are they critical to the daily delivery of your product or service. And then those tasks that you need to invest to lower the cost. Those tasks don't differentiate you, but they are critical to the daily delivery of your product or service. The framework forces startups and small business owners to face the fact that not all business tasks are equal because if everything is important, nothing is important. Please check out episode six and on iTunes or Podomatic or streaming at our website, sierra.com. In today's episode, we follow up on the theme of creating explosive revenue growth by discussing quadrant four. Invest to lower costs. We interview sales guru and founder of Synergenic Sales Group, Scott Sullivan, to get him to help make the case for outsourcing sales and marketing. Yes, I said it, outsourcing sales and marketing. Before we jump into the mastermind interview with Scott Sullivan, let's discuss what's new in Gorillapreneur News. Gorillapreneur News, news about the sharing, gig, and circular loop economy that is expected to grow to $57 billion by 2025. First in Guerrillapreneur News, the gig economy is boosting women's careers all around the globe. According to Forbes magazine, in Kenya, women Airbnb hosts earn enough on average to cover about one-third of the average household expenditures. Now in India, that number is about 31%. So the sharing economy is having a serious impact on the fortunes of women who have traditionally been excluded from the economy in many countries around the world. However, despite the changing fortunes for women in the sharing economy, very few are launching their own business. According to founder and CEO of Love a Home Swap, Debbie Waskoff, One in ten women say they want to start a business but don't. Waskov goes on to suggest that the reason for the lack of female entrepreneurs could be down to three factors. Confidence, skills, and their networks. And so what has she done? Waskov has gone out and founded Albright, a unique UK funding platform designed to provide and support and finance female-led businesses from launch to scale. That's interesting. And I think that kind of movement is going to have a significant impact on the number of women entrepreneurs and to see more women-oriented business models that leverage the sharing economy. 
But while we're talking about women-owned businesses, let's give a quick update on one that we talked about a few episodes earlier, Safer, ride-sharing service for women. Now, remember, Safer originally billed itself as a woman-only ride-hailing app. Now, however, since their launch, the company has modified its platform to allow both men and women to use the service while also still staying keenly focused on safety. Now, if you use the Safer app, drivers and riders can choose in the app which gender they're most comfortable traveling with while still utilizing all the safety components that we talked about in a previous episode. If a female rider only wants a female driver, they can specify that in the app. So that's an interesting twist, and I'm sure that was driven probably by some legal challenge to their business model. If they continue to focus on the safety aspects, and with that unique twist of giving you more of what you want as a consumer, then that's options to choose what makes you more comfortable. It's a differentiating point that's going to give them a lot of running room. We'll see if it puts enough pressure on the likes of Uber and Lyft to make them embrace that sort of change. Let's look at what's next in Gorillapreneur News. Snag a job and hustle. Now these guys, they plan to expand on-demand service for hourly workers in a bid to reshape restaurant jobs with a gig economy model. Now that, that's a mouthful. What are these guys really doing? Well, essentially, hustle and snag a job are really putting a twist on the temp worker market. Employees are paid by these two companies, by Hustle and Snag a Job, and the restaurants pay Hustle and Snag a Job, and they work kind of like a temp agency. Hustle and Snag a Job cover the costs, like the workers' compensation and other benefits, and then they take on the role of staffing these employees with the different companies that have signed up for their service. In return, employers are billed hourly. They get the flexibility to cover seasonal needs or workers who don't show up. Now, in theory, this would give workers the flexibility to choose when they pick a shift and the employers the ability to adjust their staffing in real time. This could be interesting for workers who decide to sign up with either Hustle or Snag a Job because one day you could find yourself working at Quiznos and the next day you could find yourself working at Subway. Now, That's not a stretch because both of those are sandwich-making restaurants. But what happens when you end up at Quiznos and then the next day you're at Starbucks? That's a totally different concept. What's going to happen to the workers day-to-day, week-to-week? Are they going to retain enough to be productive at these different restaurants? Will the restaurant owners see a drop-off in their productivity? They have dramatically different workflows and and machinery? Mm, Don't know. But it's an interesting way to kind of even out the demand and give both value to the workers who want more convenience and the companies who want to have a lot more staffing flexibility. I want to see where this goes. Let's keep our eye on that one. Now, remember last episode we talked about Mobark? Not Mobike, the bike sharing service. Mobark, the pet sharing service. The Beijing Chinese startup that let consumers rent a pet from their local shelter. Well, that was an interesting concept, but there's a new service, a London-based service called Cat in a Flat. No, not the Dr. Seuss Cat in a Hat. Uh, The London-based tech startup, they are dubbed the Airbnb for cat lovers, and they're rapidly growing after expanding into Amsterdam and Dublin. Julia Barnes and Catherine Buckhart launched Cat in a Hat after struggling to find a trusted cat sitter to look after Julie's feisty Tom cat before they went on vacation. Taking inspiration from Airbnb, the two wanted to find a service where they could find trusted cat sitters and match them up with people who had cat. Cat in a Flat brings together the vetted cat lovers and owners to help make the process of finding a trusted cat sitter easier than before. Now they can rely on a huge cat loving community to meet their needs as cat owners with no more stressful trips to the cattery. Now, as a gorillapreneur, here's why I like Julia and Catherine's project. They both worked while they continued to get this project off the ground in their spare time, and they spent six months, including research, planning, and the creation of a minimal viable product, or MVP, before they started their hard rollout. So they soft-launched the business first over six months, working out all the wrinkles before they continued continued a hard rollout uh, into Amsterdam and Dublin. I also like the fact that it's an internet-based business. We've talked about in a number of different episodes how you can reduce your costs 
to serve if you use platforms like the internet to be your primary channel for service delivery. And it works for them as well. They use minimal capital and minimal expense to launch the business and get to a point where they had a viable solution. Now, Cat in a Flat is free for users to join and the company generates revenue by taking about 20% service fee per booking from the Cat Sitters with all the owners paying the fixed $2 US booking fee. Now, what else is going on in Gorillapreneur News? So we talked about China earlier and China continues to have some of the most unique sharing and gig models. Well, three companies announced investment in the same day, all Chinese startups, and these were battery sharing companies. Yes, charging stations for your smartphone battery sharing companies all three of them announced investments in the same day according to the chinese magazine six tone beijing based uh, Zhao Din, a pioneer in the young industry of phone charging said that they received a 350 million yuan or a 50 million dollar funding round just one month after closing the first round of financing venture capital firm sequoia capital china and bayon capital led the investment followed by internet tech giant tencent and four other companies. So that's a huge investment in a battery charging or a phone charging startup. Now on the same day, their two competitors also received investment. Hidian and Feng Shangden also announced that they'd received investments of 100 million yuan or $14 million and 3 million yuan or about $435,000 respectively. And then earlier this month, the New York Stock Exchange listed online beauty product and luxury goods retailer, Ajami, acquired a 60% stake in Anchorbox, another major player for about 300 million yuan or $44 million. Now the question I have for all of these battery charging startups and battery sharing services is, is that model defensible? I mean, it really boils down to a real estate play, doesn't it? Because the charging stations themselves are not very expensive. The models can be duplicated pretty quickly. So is that a sustainable model? Well, since April, Various forms of charging stations have sprung up all over shopping malls, restaurants, bus stops across China. And as with the bike sharing services, users can locate the stations through an app or scan a QR code, pay a deposit and use the service and take the battery pack or plug into a charging station depending on the company's model. Battery packs can be rented for as little as one yuan or 15 cents per hour and can be returned anywhere there's a station in China. Interesting. I know the millennials are eating that up in China because it just eliminates one more thing that they have to worry about. Walk out the door, know anywhere you go, you can get your phone charged for as little as 15 cents. Now, all of these models are tech companies that are coming in and shaking up industries. Everybody remembers how Uber shook up the taxi cab industry. What if it had been the other way around? What if the taxi company launched the technology before the guys at Uber got out there and they shook up the market and changed it? We're seeing that happen now for home cleaning services. Yes, a new home cleaning platform, Up and Go, has decided to shake up the gig economy by the workers taking control of the platform. Yes. According to MarketWire, Up and Go, a web app that offers on-demand cleaning services at guaranteed fair wages, was launched by four women-run worker cooperatives. Now, they did this in response to an influx of tech giants seeking to transform the residential cleaning industry. The worker-owned businesses, Brightly Cleaning Cooperative, Cooperative Cleaning of New York, Ecomondo Cleaning Cooperative, they all teamed up to compete against these tech ventures and to maintain their competitive foothold in the home cleaning service. As home cleaning professionals and small business owners, they said they needed to tap into changes in the industry in order to reach more clients and to maintain their commitment to a fair and, and quality wage for their current workers. Up and go home cleaning professionals earn about four to five dollars more per hour than the cleaning industry professionals who work for the tech companies because the tech companies are taking more per hour for the use of their platform. If up and go can uh, sustain that, I think they're going to get the lion's share of the cleaning professionals want to work on their platform versus working for the tech giants. That's a lesson for all of the people who fear their market being disrupted. Don't wait to be disrupted. You eat your own lunch, and that way you can control your own destiny. Well, that's Gorillapreneur News. 
And now it's time to transition to our mastermind interview with sales guru, Scott Sullivan. You know, entrepreneurs, founders, and small business owners are often overwhelmed by the day-to-day whirlwind that they don't have time to focus on explosive growth. In episode six, we gave the audience a growth capacity framework for prioritizing work tasks that do not differentiate the business or improve the day-to-day operations so that they could outsource those tasks to a specialist who could reduce or standardize the cost. In episode seven, we want to build on the theme of creating explosive small business growth capacity by focusing on the option to outsource sales and marketing to a specialist. And we're pleased to have sales guru Scott Sullivan on the podcast with us. Scott is the founder of Synergenic Sales Group, also known as Scott Sullivan and Associates, and he brings 30 years of professional sales and marketing experience in the energy sector, both domestic and international. Having worked with global renewable energy companies on both the utility and commercial projects, Scott's experience makes him recognized as an industry expert. In the energy sector, Scott has worked on the demand side, the supply side, and energy efficiency projects, helping companies reduce their carbon footprint while saving money. Scott was in California on the front lines of deregulations with both the gas and electricity industry. His last 20 years have been spent in the renewable energy sector, working with PV panel manufacturers, power electric manufacturers or inverters, including fuel cell manufacturers and renewable project developers. Scott has the ability to extract the value proposition from a complex, multifaceted deal, boil it down to simple concepts and pass that information on to the client. Scott's ability to find connections between both people and companies has earned him the reputation of a true networker and the respect of his colleagues. Scott, wow, you're in the sweet spot of the energy sector. Why the passion for small businesses? Well, Mark, first of all, let me say thank you very much for having me on the broadcast today. I'm a big fan, and I love the series that you're starting right now. And I've got to tell you, I can hardly wait to to let my uh, network know more about the Gorilla Panora because I think it's a a, a fantastic opportunity for young and startup companies, Uh, even those that I call uh, companies that are in transition, because transition can mean they could be growing or they could actually be shrinking uh, to some extent because maybe the the CEO or someone in the organization got out a little bit ahead of themselves and they, you know, how cash flow is sometimes it ebbs and flows. So there's also times during transition that CEOs need help when they're shrinking back to the core competency of what they're actually doing. But to, to answer your question, why the passion for, for small businesses, I, I truly believe that is the, the, the future and the growth of our country, not only uh, in each of our industries, but I think that's where the actual spirit of America lives. I think that it's fantastic to have a General Electric or a Microsoft, or those are those are fantastic companies that have done a, a tremendous good for our for our country and for the industry in, in a whole. However, if you think back just not too many years ago, those were those were those exact you know companies that we're looking at now. Uh, those small businesses, the guys that started in the garages, the, you know, the Hewlett Packards of the world and the Ebays and the, the people that just had a crazy idea. And everybody said, why are you doing that? Because now look at it, they're changing the world. I mean, when was the last time that, you know, you looked at, uh, how much you actually pay for a cell phone bill, but just, it wasn't too many years ago. We didn't have cell, right? We didn't have a cellular phone that we carried around with us. It was stop at a pay phone and find a dime or a quarter to make that phone call. So without that young entrepreneurial spirit, we're not going to be able to leapfrog the technology. So that's why my passion is, is in that. And I have been gravitated towards the energy business since uh, grad school days. So that's that's the only place I really want to work. And my wife calls me a one trip pony, but uh, I think it's a really good a really good place to be and a, a good space to be in. Absolutely. Now you mentioned some great companies that have built. Fascinating uh, technologies, GE, uh, Google, eBay. Why is the sales and marketing function so important to startups and entrepreneurs? 
Well, you know, we everyone knows cash is king. You know, we have to have revenue. I, I tell my clients all the time that you have to have growth. So you can grow a multitude of ways. Um, you can go out to the venture capitals of the world. You can go out to debt equity. You can go out and make a presentation to somebody who believes in you that has a high net worth already, and they want to put that money to work. And there's a good chance they'll invest in you and your company, which is a very viable, very great alternative. But I also believe that there are entrepreneurs out there right now that, you know, haven't got quite to that that point. Now, wh- what do I mean by that? So you could have an idea, just a kernel of an idea. You could take it to VC and you could get money to grow the company. And at some point, you're going to be in a in a very very diluted position. You you may or may not be in control of your own company and your own idea any longer because you started very very early. So the further you can get down the stream into cash flow, revenue generation, proof of concept, if you will, the less risk that the capital or venture capital person needs to give or take on. And with that less risk, a less of your company you have to give away. So what I tell young entrepreneurs, let's do meteoric growth. Let's, uh, let's take this to the next level, show proof of concept, because then when you go out to finance the rest of your, your growth, you're going to give up a whole lot less of your company and you're going to have a whole lot larger return because you've already proved the concept, lowering the risk for the investor. I hope that, uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. From my own experience with my last business, we were fortunate enough to have a business that was throwing off a lot of free cash flow and allowed us to grow without getting an initial investment, and we were well past a million dollars in revenue before you know, we looked around and said, you know, do we need some additional capital to get explosive growth? So you know, two thumbs up behind everything you're saying. If you can create a, a proof of concept, you have greater leverage in a discussion with people who want to invest in your business because you have a model that's working. So absolutely, yes. I, I believe yeah. in what you're saying. So yeah. tell us then, how does Synergistic Sales Group help an entrepreneur with an idea get that proof of concept started? Okay, great. So the first word in the name of the company is synergenic. And the reason why we use that is because we truly believe there's a synergy between you know, sales, marketing, marketing operations, sales operations. I mean, just everything within the organization has to work in a synergistic manner. So we use the synergetic term to say, uh, to kind of establish the, the core belief of our, of our company. Unfortunately, what happens, and I'll just, you and I both know that the, that there's a very high failure rate in, entrepreneurs starting up new companies. It's, it's fantastic, and please don't ever, if there's any entrepreneurs out there listening right now, take the chance. Jump out there with both feet and, and go for it. We know that there are some, some failures, and the reason why is additionally because the CEO or the person with the idea has a very, very strong aptitude for one, possibly two of the areas of running a business, but they're usually not extremely well-rounded. So, and I'm going to use this as an example, but it's but not by no means is it the only way that this works. But if you have an inventor, a, a, a man or woman that's tinkering in their basement, and all of a sudden they come up with this fantastic product, that product then can be the you know the core and the kernel of a brand new company, and you could build an entire company around it. And if you're the the chief technologist or the chief technology officer, and you know everything there is to know about that product, and you're passionate about it, and you love it, it's fairly easy to sell the idea or the concept to the first few people, right? Because your enthusiasm, I like to say, Mark, there's a a saying that we've used in our industry a long time is, if you set yourself on fire, people will come to watch. So if you have enough passion for the product or service that you are you know, espousing, then you can probably draw at least some audience. Somebody will come and, and watch. So I think the, the early days, the entrepreneur starts to get bolstered by a little bit of success. But then there starts to be some obstacles. You know, how are you financing it? You know, does it take capital to install it? Is there a, a learning curve? Is there a manufacturing curve? All of those things. And the, then the entrepreneur sometimes doesn't have that expertise. And then that's what you find out. You find a out of the gate very quickly, 
and then very quickly falling off because as soon as a few obstacles occur. Well, sales and marketing happens to be one of those. So if you're very, very passionate about your product and you want to sell it, you probably had success early days, but then it takes more of a, a successful professional sales force you know, map the system, make sure that you have the right combination of art and science, as we call it. How many calls does it take? What's the sales cycle? What's the best price point for putting your product in? All of those things that come along with that. So what the Synergenic Sales Group does is exactly that. You outsource your sales and marketing to us, and then we carry that water. We are the, the heavy lifters. We take all of that sales off of your plate. You concentrate on building the best product you can, and we'll concentrate on selling it. I know we're going to talk a little bit in a, just in a few minutes about how that works in a pricing strategy, but overall, that's the general concept of the Synergistic Sales Group. We take that heavy lifting and carry that sales model forward for those entrepreneurs that maybe, maybe don't have 30 years of professional sales experience. That's where the outsourcing comes in. Well, let, let's go ahead and dig into that. Tell us a little bit more about how that would be structured for an entrepreneur because I know having talked to you a little bit about this earlier, I wish I had met you 10 years ago. <laughs> it would have made my life so much easier to be able to stay focused on the technology and have a team behind the product that knew exactly what they were doing from a sales and marketing perspective. We bumped our head into everything you could bump into until that we figured out how to sell the product. So it would have been great to have an expert with a business model that could move in, in lockstep with what we could afford to pay in order to grow the company. Exactly. And see, that's, you just touched on exactly the key, Mark, the being in lockstep with the ability to pay. So let's go back to that same example of a young lady who invents this great product in her basement, and the next thing she knows, she, she brings it out to the market. If it's growing organically, if you're funding it yourself, that means, you know, and none of this is, doesn't have to be cast in stone, but it's very typical of what I've found in my history. You, you take out a second mortgage on your house. You max out your credit cards. You borrow money from your, your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, your grandparents, somebody. So that's how you start with the company. So the last thing in the world you can afford to do is to plunk down, you know, a, a very large chunk of cash to hire a very mature, very experienced salesperson, even though that's probably what you need, that investment hasn't got there yet. So you haven't worked out all the back end and the back office systems. You may or may not even know how to even invoice your customer for the very first sale because you might be doing it on a Word document at nights and weekends doing your own invoicing. All of that very much how the American spirit is alive in entrepreneurship today. So what we do at SSG, we call it SSG, the Synergenic Sales Group. What we do at SSG is we come in and say, look, you can't afford to pay us what we really are worth. And I mean, and I know that sounds egotistical, but it really is the truth. I mean, the, the gentlemen that I have working with me are all very, very high figure sales professionals. They've all been very successful in their career. We're all gray-haired and mature. <laughs> so uh, what does that mean? Uh, we're all in our late 40s or 50s, and our kids are, for the most part, adults already. So we have found ourselves in this position where we aren't struggling with kids in college, and, and we don't have that massive overhead that everybody else has. But now, that being said, we don't want to work for free, obviously. I mean, we, have a, we still have 10 or 15 years of our career left. We'd like to make that work. So what we do is we don't overburden the company with a big, huge, giant salary. Unfortunately, what happens is the entrepreneur goes and hires somebody, and then you're taking on 100% of that risk. The training for that person, making sure that they are you know, doing what they say, the management of what they do, and then you have to provide all the follow-up and all the things that come behind. So what we have found at SSG is that that puts on too much of a burden and it actually drags down uh, the entrepreneurial spirit. So what we have done is we've worked out a really great model. For, price, for the less than the price of a full-time equivalent, what do I mean by that? If you hired a regular person in Northern California where we are, where we reside, you're probably going to pay anywhere from a hundred to $150,000 a year in base salary, plus a commission, plus travel expenses, all those things. So they add up to a very substantial amount of money. By the time you pay perks and bennies and everything else, you're looking at probably a $200,000 investment for the first year. 
And if your product, depending on the product or service that you have, you have to then do a real strong evaluation of what that profit margin is. If you're working at a 30% gross margin and you're selling a relatively inexpensive item and the volume's not there yet, it's going to take years for IRR for you to pull back and get enough capital back from organic growth to pay for that, that sales channel. So we at SSG sit down with you as the entrepreneur CEO, the founder, and we actually give you a free evaluation. We walk through that entire process with you. What is your product? Uh, how, how much revenue can it generate? What's your margin? What's your ASR? How are we going to pull that whole thing together into a package? And then we match our fee with what you can afford to pay, meaning we have a small piece of monthly upfront. And the reason why we do that, Mark, is real, real clear. If you don't pay a little bit upfront, then you have to have a little skin in the game and you have to buy a little bit of our mind share. You need us to be engaged every single day. So we have a small monthly fee that we charge as a retainer. And then we work very, very heavily on what the company can afford on the commission side. So we come back and leverage our success with yours. We put our money where your money is. We put them in alignment with each other. Because now we say, look, you have a, a great product. You have, a, let's say you have a 60% gross margin. We know we can sell it. We're going to do X number of millions. You're going to put this much money in the bank from a revenue standpoint. And then we want a percentage of that after you have received the revenue, after you've booked the sale, after it's already now working capital. So you can see we put no burden on the company because we're helping you actually synergetically. And with that's where the name comes from. We're helping you to actually grow your company for the right reason. Now, the third and fourth ways we get paid. So that's the first and second. The first way we get paid is a small monthly retainer. The second is we leverage our ability with your commission on the backside. And then the third way is usually we put a milestone bonus in. And we say, look, you know, we put a stretch bonus. You want to you do a million dollars in sales this year? Fantastic. Congratulations. We think we can get there. But if we do $1.5 million, We'd like to have an extra point or two of that extra, you know, bonus. So maybe it's fifty thousand dollars, maybe it's ten thousand dollars, maybe it's five thousand dollars. Doesn't matter. But there's some type of incentivized role. And then the very last way, the fourth way, is if you're just a company that just doesn't have any of that as far as cash flow, and you're just absolutely just getting started, we also have an option where we work on an equity basis with you. So let's say you're willing to give us. You know, the last deal that we did, we got 9% of the company. And we took them from um, a few hundred thousand dollars in sales to many, many millions of dollars in sales. And for that, we ended up with an equity stake of 9% of the company. And that will eventually pay off as soon as we have a, an exit strategy for either, you know, acquisition or IPO or however it works. But, but that's like putting money in the bank for us because we helped you at the very, very, very early days we took no cash, and we ended up not costing you anything, um, but we did take a small percentage of the company. And the nice thing about that also is it keeps us engaged as, you, as your strategic partners all the way through you know, to whatever your exit strategy is. We now have a, a seat on the board. Uh, we spend time with that entrepreneur and that CEO helping him to map out the next strategy for where his product's going to go. And you get a full, absolutely full team, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, about what my team brings to the table. But there's six of us, and they, they cost you less than the price of a full-time equivalent. That's a, a model that is extremely exciting for a small business owner or an entrepreneur or startup, because in addition to that top-line growth, I know we've talked about the, the back-end support. Once you book the sale, that's a big piece of getting the company rolling, but then maintaining those accounts, um, having the infrastructure and expertise to retain that client so that that growth is sustained year over year is no small order as well. And having a team that you can have many different ways to pay is great for an entrepreneur. We appreciate that. that we're, um, we find ourselves in a position, unfortunately, um, more times than not, when we have our, our free consultation with our CEO, we love what you're saying. We, have, we get you know, dozens of calls a month of, of people that would like to work with us. 
but it it has to be uh, it really does have to be synergetic. But we like for it to be in the renewable space if possible, but at least in the energy space. So you know, water, wastewater, electricity, natural gas. Somewhere in the in the energy sector helps us a lot because that's where you know ninety percent of our expertise is, and that's where our network is. When you hit a stage where you do have sustained growth, how easy is it for a company should they decide? to reintegrate that function in-house when they have the cash flow to, to finance it? That's it. Mark, that is the best question. Every single presentation we make, every, without a doubt, to, to every, to a, to a 100%, every single presentation we make, that question comes up. So how do I stop relying on SSG and get back into what I know is least, less expensive to do it in-house? Absolutely perfect question. We literally work ourselves out of a job every quarter. Every quarter, we end up losing a client somewhere along the way because we we have got them to that point. We start at the very, very, very beginning. Usually our first or second meeting, we sit down with the CEO and say, what is it that you're going to need from a revenue standpoint in order to bring this back in-house? What is it that you need to do? Again, you got to remember at the end of the day, we want to not be a burden. You know that, uh, that Hippocratic oath that says, first do no harm that the doctors take? Well, we feel very strongly about that, too. First, first and foremost, be not an excessive burden to the company. Because if you are, your value just completely diminishes. So at the very beginning of our engagement, we sit down with the CEO and say, so let's walk through this. Let me see your business plan. Do you have a pro forma? You know, some of the CEOs, some have them. Some of them are super, super well-prepared and organized. And sometimes the CEO just has a great idea and just knows he wants to sell it. So it, it depends on the company. But we sit down with them and help them strategize about what's it going to take to then bring this in-house. But here's the key. The key is, is that when we work ourselves out of a job, we help you find the right person, meaning we don't have a recruiting service, but... I have had members of my organization through SSG actually come back to me and say, Scott, I really like this company we're working with. I decided to take the role as VP of sales and then just literally walk over and become the VP of sales for the client company. And that, to me, is a fantastic, you know, most, most of the CEOs would go, oh, that's awful. I just lost one of my great guys. For me, it's fantastic. It's, it's, it's a win, win, win. because now we have somebody that helps them get there who's passionate about the business. And so for me, that's the win-win. We start at the very, very beginning saying, what's it going to take to get this back in-house? And then we try and stay engaged with that client over multiple of years, coming in once a quarter for a tuna. And I've got to tell you, we have now probably maybe eight or ten of those clients right now that every quarter call us and say, hey, we're hiring three new sales guys. We're still on a meteoric growth. We love what you've done. Can you come in and give them your uh, kind of indoctrination on how we do our CRM and how we, you know, what our communication protocol looks like and how we actually follow up? And, and by the way, we're also really huge in social media. So, you know, maybe you can come in and give us the new guys, a, you know, a little primer on how to use social media because these guys aren't even, we're not even getting a single picture of our installs or something like that. I mean, so it's, it's a win-win for us. We, we love having that conversation. So we have a plan and a strategy set out very early. And as soon as we start hitting those milestones, we start recruiting that position. And sometimes it comes out of our, our shop and sometimes it doesn't. And we find them outside. So it, it really is. It, that's why the, the word synergetic is so important to us because it really is a partnership and that's why we're so selective on the, the clients that we choose and to work with. You really are partners, and your name certainly encapsulates that. If I am a CEO entrepreneur sitting here listening to this podcast, at what stage would it make the most sense to give you a call and get the benefit of a relationship that you just described? So let's walk through the different types of CEOs. For just If you're a CEO that comes out of the uh, product or service category, let's say um, you've done something for a lot of years for somebody else. You decide to step away and open your own shop and hang out your own shingle. If you're the person who is the inventor, the service provider, if you're the, 
If you're passionate about the product or the service, then you should call us day one because we are literally sales and market. We can help you with operations. Between the three of us, we have over 80 years experience total. I have over 30 and uh, one of my other gentlemen has over 30 and then I have one that got 25 years. So we've got a lot of history. So if you're on the product or service side and that's where you're coming from as the CEO, you should call us day one. Now, a lot of CEOs also come out of the sales side, and then there's some that come out of finance, and there's some that come out of operations. So depending on what area of the company that you are most capable and your skill set is most honed to, then that kind of depends on the engagement. At some point, the CEO is going to have a moment of, I don't like to use the word overwhelming, but they're going to feel just slightly out of their depth. As soon as they feel that, it's already too late. And I know that sounds really awful, but as soon as you realize that the water is too hot, then you're already way past the point where you should be getting out. So very early, I would suggest at least have the conversation, picking up the phone, calling us, checking with us on LinkedIn, sending us something through social media, Facebook or Twitter. It's all free. Just pick up the phone and call us. We live, our entire motto from our company is we live our business world and our life from a place of abundance. We give very, very freely of our time. We give very freely of our advice. We do not operate from a position of fear. We hold nothing back. We give everything as much as we possibly can. If a CEO or an entrepreneur calls, we will do everything in our power to give them as much time as we possibly can on the phone. Nights, weekends, whatever whatever they need, we'll acquiesce and come to their schedule if at all possible. We truly, truly believe that. So just pick up the phone and call us early. Now, if you're uh, in the sales side, you come up out of the sales side into the CEO position, then you probably are already very well versed on putting the right processes in place for sales and marketing. So maybe in that particular case, you want us just to do an evaluation to see, you know, how are things going and maybe have a light, a slight oversight. Uh, where we can just kind of keep an eye on things for you as you go out and endeavor all the things you have to do as a CEO, because you're going to have many, many, many hats to, to wear as a CEO. So obviously earlier is better. It doesn't cost anything to, to call us and get to know us. You had mentioned uh, an example of a company, a software company uh, that you work with, where that call came to you and that CEO was in that position needing that sales support. Walk us through that example so that the audience clearly understands that call from that CEO is critical at the stage before the water gets too hot. <laughs> okay. Uh, perfect example. This is a real-life example of what the FSG team does. We were working with a software company that they get both monitoring, which meant you know you connect a bunch of devices, hardware devices, to your solar array, and then you take that information, you put it up in the cloud, and then you follow how well the system is performing, and then the CEO augmented that by offering alarms and alerts and a whole lot of other things. In the in our space, we, we there's two two terms for that. One's called M and V, monitoring and verification, and then there's also just the the renewable energy monitoring space. So this CEO, it was his first CEO position ever. He had never. Um, he'd never been in a CEO role. He was a computer programmer and a chief scientist. He had been working for another very large company and had spent a lot of years, you know, staring at a computer screen and coming up with some great products. Well, during the, the course of this, this career that he had, everybody just kept kind of nudging him and saying, guys, you know, you just, you need to be doing this on your own because all you're doing is augmenting the profits of another company who's not sharing that with you. And he finally stepped out on his own and he realized very, very, very quickly that he had a tremendous passion for the product, but he had no idea how to take that and sell it as a, what we call SaaS, software as a service. He didn't understand the SaaS model. He didn't understand the service bureau where someone could actually use the software and then resell the product that the that the software generated. So there were there were several channels that he didn't understand completely as the guy who was building it. So very early on, I mean, he was barely in. He had made his first two sales, 
and he was just getting those first two sales implemented, and he had around $300,000 in revenue that first year, which is not an insignificant feat. So let me first of all congratulate him. That was a, you know, to get to 300, zero to 300,000 in 12 months is a, was, a, was a big deal. But he realized that in order for this to be, to pay off all of the research and development, all the uh, coding time, he knew that it was going to take more cash. So he reached out to us. This particular product, at being soft, there was a very nice, healthy margin in it. So we were able to leverage the backside uh, without any cash up front, a very, very small amount of cash up front. We were able to leverage on the commission side. And in less than two years, we took him to just over $15 million in sales. Now, that was a success story for SSG that for us is second to none because we did get a small equity piece of the company and we also got a heavy commission on the back side. Now, I'm very proud to tell you that his entire sales team is now in-house and he's also one of those 10 companies I mentioned earlier that we do a quarterly tune-up. So he doesn't hire a new salesperson without us vetting them and without us training them. So he is 100% sold on the fact that you know, using the, synerg- the Synergenic Sales Group was the absolute best thing, and he doesn't mind telling everybody. He stands up on a soapbox and, and screams it for us, and, and we appreciate that testimony. That is a, an example that should excite every entrepreneur out there. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, they seem to want to wear many hats as a badge of honor. I hope from this conversation they see that that badge of honor can be replaced with millions of dollars in their pocket <laughs> if they outsource, <laughs> you know, outsource functions you know, to the right people. You're exactly right, Mark. There's no doubt about it. I will tell you, though, uh, our biggest obstacle, and, and, and you know, I don't have to, I don't have to say this out loud. I'm sure that you already know it, but the single largest obstacle we have is the fact that historically, sales and marketing is a very strong internal ownership. They say, well, how do I own the client? Isn't that relationship supposed to be with us? And so we actually integrate directly into your company. Let's just be real clear here, so that your listeners understand. If I were engaging right now with Gorillapreneur, my email address would say scott at gorillapreneur.com, right? I, I would have an email address. I would look like I'm part of the team. We're fully integrated. I mean, we, we treat you like if we're employees. I mean, we, we represent you to the absolute best of our ability, and we pull on your resources. We use your application engineering. We use your product development. We use your inside sales or your marketing or whatever you have from a resource standpoint. We will utilize that to the full effect. Now, talk, let's talk a little bit about the downside. The downside on you know, working you know, with an outsourced sales and marketing is, and I don't know any other way to tell it just to say other than to be just totally transparent with you, is you know, we push on your organization pretty hard. Because is your company ready to fulfill a million-dollar order today? I mean, if we actually went out and got you a million dollars worth of business, how would you then fulfill that? You know, and we have that conversation with our CEO very early. And I know it sounds very narcissistic, but you're getting three professional, mature, executive salespeople that have very, very deep networks. And it's very likely that in the first 90 days, you're going to see a lot of movement. And that generates a lot of anxiety for CEOs because where they've been getting one sale a year, now all of a sudden they have 10. What do you do with that, right? So we have to have that conversation early and often because if we're leveraging our our success on your success, meaning we can't get paid until you do, then we need you to get paid. (laughs) So we need to also know that you can deliver the product and actually collect the money and that you have the process. So we back up our three guys with three administrative assistants and social media and researchers. So we have a total team of six. We found very early that we needed to have that support because we couldn't rely on our clients. And the other thing we found out too is, is that most of our clients don't have a strong CRM, a customer relationship management software platform. So we implement our own. All of your contacts are yours. We dedicate and, and you know, make sure that you have a report every single month of every client we talk to, what, who we talk to, what we talked about, why it's important. So if anything ever happens and you decide to disengage with SSG, you have 100% up-to-date everything. 
any files, any documents, anything else are all kept on your server, not on ours. So we we have working documents that we work with, but every month we make sure everything is transferred to you so that you have a full access on everything that's going on. And if you want, we can give you access to our CRM or we can work with your CRM if you've been proactive and already bought one. So so those are some of the downsides, but overall, like I said, it's been very, very successful, and we get a whole lot more companies than we can handle uh, every year. But, uh, but reach out as early as and often as you can to, to outsource. Find a partner to do the things that you can't do really well, and your company will grow 10 times faster. That's great advice. That's a conversation that I put right up front when talking with entrepreneurs, when talking about growth. The worst thing that I know happened to one of my startups was success. We (laughs) get too many contracts, and then you can't fulfill the mission on the back end with sales and support, and the customer then becomes frustrated with your business. And that word of mouth can hurt your future growth. And that's great to have a partner that's that's thinking about that and in sync with you, we were maintaining clients in Excel spreadsheets, trying to keep up with data and didn't install a CRM until late in the process. To have a partner that already has that expertise and knows many different platforms and could have even counseled us on which would be a better platform for our business is, again, invaluable resource to have uh, for uh, an entrepreneur who's dedicated to their technology but doesn't have expertise in all the systems needed to run an enterprise. Are there there any other words of wisdom you would give them? Well, the only thing I can say is there's always have a mentor. I have, uh, I've been a professional salesperson for over 30 years and I still have two mentors that I call on a regular basis. It's, it never hurts to get another opinion. I have a gentleman that I have known literally now for 45 years and he's been retired for over 30 years, I think 25 years. And he's in his late 80s, and I still love to go sit down with him and have an hour-long conversation because as as much as we like to think that technology has changed our lives and where we are, and it has, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, when I started, I wrote my uh, my college papers on a Smith Corona electric typewriter, right? You know? <laughs> so, and we didn't have fax machines, and we didn't have, uh, you know, we used slide rolls, we didn't have... Uh, fax machines or cell phones or computers or any of that stuff. So, so yes, it has changed. But the interpersonal relationship, people like to buy from people that they know, like, and trust, right? At the end of the day, when was the last time that you bought a major appliance or a car or something from somebody who was rude to you or disrespected you or didn't pay any attention to you when you walked onto the showroom floor? It's just a common courtesy, people like to buy from people they know, like, and trust. So my first piece of advice was don't ever lose that mentorship. Find somebody that you know, like, and trust, that you can use as a sounding board, that you can talk things through. And in some cases, it ends up being somebody not even in the same industry you are, but maybe in the same vein. Maybe they were a CEO. Maybe they started their own company, or maybe they were advisors to another CEO or something, but keep that connection and, and, and be accountable, you know, go to that person and sit down with them and say, this is, what do you think of this? And then when they give you advice, come back and tell them and give them that feedback because those interpersonal relationships have been the same since the day when we were using, you know, a dime or a quarter for a payphone to where we're picking up our cell phone and calling them. It's the same interpersonal relationship skills that get us to where we need to be today. Now, yes, I know. Don't please, I don't don't write letters and send emails and tweets. Um, I know we can buy a lot of stuff on Amazon, and I can go to my Amazon app and I can push a button, and tomorrow I can have it delivered to my house. Yes, I know that. But still, a lot of things happen during the course of the day with other people, people that you know, like, and trust. So, the first and foremost is. Keep the relationships and, that you have and don't burn those bridges. Secondly, keep that mentorship going no matter what. There's a uh, meme going around that says your vibe is your tribe. So keep putting yourself out there and be uh, just completely open and transparent with your time and your energy and people will, will come to you naturally. But the last thing is is that I, I want to take the last, piece, the last minute of this 
this broadcast to give you this piece of advice. The world wants you to be well-rounded. So if you take a really nice, you know, like a cue ball of a pool of a billiards ball, you take a cue ball, it's super well-rounded, it's smooth all the way around. The world wants you to be that way. They want to knock off all your rough edges. I have a different philosophy on that. There used to be a weapon in medieval times called a mace, and it was a round ball, and it had these big spiky things stuck on it. And it would be on a piece of chain, and it was attached to a stick, and they used to wield it. And it, those big spiky things were, you know, like the weapon, but the ball was the, the heavy part. So I, I think of life in that, in that. So the world wants you to be well-rounded. I want you to be a mace. And the reason why I want you to be a mace is because every one of those spikes is a talent or a skill that you're really good at. If you try and be good at everything, not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You're going to fail in more cases than you succeed. So use those skills and talents. If you have, if you're the best closer in the entire world, but that phone weighs 900 pounds to call and get the appointment, you're not going to get the chance to close unless you get the appointment. So your job is no more important than the person picking up the phone and making that phone call to get the appointment. So find the person who is a mace with their little spike, which is the phone is their friend, and they can pick up the phone and can get that appointment. But gosh, it would kill them to close. So the two of you together now are one plus one equals 11 and not two. Right? So that's what I keep saying to my clients. I tell them every day, find the things that you're really, really good at and hone those to a razor's edge and get really, really good at three or four or five things. And the rest of the world, don't worry about it. My advice to all entrepreneurs is do what you're really good at and you're very passionate about. Outsource the rest. Leverage your product and service and your passion. Pay your people after you get paid. Let their performance speak for themselves instead of them telling you how great they are. Come and try us, you know? Give us, a, give us a few hundred dollars to get us engaged, and then we'll go bring you some sales and show you how good we are. So uh, that would be my advice to all entrepreneurs. And, and Mark, I can't even begin to tell you how much I've appreciated your time today, and thank you so much for, for having me as a guest. I am a disciple. I am now going to go tell everyone <laughs> to become a mace. I'm going to buy the little foam mace, and I'm going to start giving those out. And telling I'm entrepreneurs to come from me. I'm going to go buy some. <laughs> <laughs> Tell everyone, how can they find you? How can they engage and keep this conversation going? Well, I'm on Twitter every day at uh, Sales with Sully. And then our company Twitter is at Adding Revenue because that's what we do. We add revenue. A formal, official name of the company is Scott Sullivan & Associates. But our URL is uh, scottsullivan.biz. You can go there. I don't mind telling you my, my cell phone number if you want to call me direct personally. I know this is crazy to do on a, on a broadcast, but I believe me, this is the abundance I live from in my life. My Northern California cell phone number is 707-631-5668. Just, you can give me a call. Obviously, Scott at ScottSullivan.biz is my email address. I am real, real, real popular on LinkedIn. I've got a network of over 65,000 on LinkedIn, and I've got over 100,000 on Twitter. So I should not be hard to find if you need to get a hold of me. Well, perfect. We'll put all that in the show notes. Mark, thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I can't tell you what a huge fan I am. I'm, I can hardly wait to hear the rest of the series. Uh, I am a, I'm a disciple of the Gorillapreneur already. Uh, follow you and... I'm just honored. I'm just truly honored to be a part of your organization. And I think this is what, uh, you know, synergistic means. It's being able to pull things together like this where the one plus one equals more than two. So thank you so much for your time. And I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. Have a great day. Wow. What a great podcast. I want to thank Scott Sullivan of Sullivan and Associates for being on the podcast. And I want to thank you for listening to Gorilla Panure. The Art of Waging Small Business Warfare podcast. I want to thank you for putting up with the sound quality. Both Scott and I were on the road and the connection wasn't great, but the information was the bomb. If you like this podcast, you're probably going to enjoy my book, Gorilla Panure, Small Business Strategy for David's Wanting to Defeat Goliaths. Look for it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and iTunes. Please follow me on Facebook. Instagram, Twitter, and Periscope at Gorilla Panor. Sign up for our newsletter at Sierra.com. We have templates 
and startup documents for entrepreneurs and for business mavericks. Keep this movement growing. Hit the subscribe button to follow this podcast. I want to thank Philip Williams, the three times Inc. 5000 CEO out in Tucson, Arizona, who subscribed and has listened to all previous six episodes. Thanks, Philip. I appreciate the support. Now I want to close with a quote from the great Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu. Victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. Keep fighting, guerrilla